Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this next session of uh, fetal and neonatal neurology. We are talking on fetal neurology, what a pediatric neurologist should do. And we'll be having the talk on fetal CNS anomalies perspectives from our fetal medicine expert, Dr. Mandeep Singh, and genetic evaluation uh, uh, in uh, these children uh, by Dr. Shagun. Dr. Mandeep Singh is consultant and subspecialist uh, is the maternal fetal medicine, fetal therapy director, Kepros uh, Nikulits uh, Fetal Medicine and Therapy Center, Abu Dhabi, and divisional chair of Women Health, um, uh, Burjil Medical City, Abu Dhabi. He's done a diploma in uh, fetal medicine and uh, CCT, uh, ONG, MFM, uh, UK, with special interest in fetal therapies, preterm labor, preeclampsia, and use of ultrasound in labor. And in a uh, lot of publications, and is associate editor of Genetics Update for Next Generation Clinician. He's a uh, ex medical director, Mid and South Essex NHS Foundation, Essex, UK. And then it will be followed by uh, Dr. Shagan, who will be talking on the genetic aspects. She is additional professor and head department of medical genetics in the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, adjunct scientist, center for DNA fingerprinting and diagnostics, who after MD in OBS and Gynae did DM in medical genetics, with an interest in genetic characterization of fetal malformation syndromes, uh, besides many, pretty many research papers uh, and, uh, and editorials to her credit. She's ex-treasurer and executive committee member of Indian Academy of Medical Genetics and has a lot of uh, acclamations and affiliations. Uh, we have uh, experts uh, which are uh, uh, a very um, you know diverse panel of experts. We have Dr. Pinar, uh, Gensi Pinar, uh, uh, joining us from Izmir, Turkey. She's a pediatric neurologist at the Izmir Katib Selebi University and currently pursuing her PhD in molecular biology and genetics, especially neurogenomics at the Izmir Biomedicine and Genome Center. And uh, she's interested in neurogenetics and genetics of neonatal brain development and uh, the prediction abilities and the neurodevelopmental prognosis. And she has clinical and experimental publications on neurodevelopmental outcome and neonatal seizures. Then we have Dr. Prashant Acharya, who is Medical Director and Chief Consultant, Paris Advanced Center for Fetal Medicine, Ahmedabad in India, who is a MD and FICOG and with a special interest in fetal cardiology, fetal growth and Doppler and ultrasound, fetal pathology and autopsies and fetal intervention, has written, has uh, many publications to his credit and lots, lots of uh, national and international achievements. And we have a big stalwart of uh, uh, medical genetics, uh, Professor Shubha Fatke. And uh, she's professor and head of Department of Medical Genetics, Sanjay Gandhi, postgraduate in of Medical Sciences, Lucknow. And uh, she has uh, she's interested in pre and postnatal dysmorphology, psychosocial issues in genetic counseling and molecular diagnostics. And she has numerous um, publications. And she was a founder president of the Society for Indian Academy of Medical Genetics and has innumerable awards to her credit. And she started the first, she, uh, she's the first DM in medical genetics from India and has reported 10 new malformation syndromes. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for joining. And the moderator of the session is going to be Dr. Juhi, who has been our alumnus and uh, a, a student and right now an assistant professor of pediatric neurology in SMS uh, Medical College, Jaipur. And uh, she's also currently the chair of FLICNA, which is a few, uh, for the young researchers, uh, of future leaders of ICNA. And uh, her interest is uh, pediatric epilepsy, stroke, neuroimmunology, neuromuscle disorders, and has over 25 publications. Uh, her, her DM dissertation with me was on uh, neuromodulation in asymmetric cerebral palsy and has um, got a lot of accolades for and awards for the same and many more awards. And uh, over to you, Dr. Juhi. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, so I think we can uh, request our first speaker to start the session. Dr. Mandeep, please start sharing your screen. Thank you. I will just share my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. You know, we can see you. Not the says presentation, but it's your screen. I'll share again. I 
and is that visible now yes it's visible perfect uh, thank you for inviting me to do the talk on uh, fetal cns anomalies obviously uh, fetal cns is a very very big topic uh, that uh, requires a lot of time to cover in detail however what i would try and do is give you a perspective from the from a routine fetal medicine um, uh, consultant or a fetal medicine expert um, uh, i think brain is one of the most complex uh, complex structures uh, as far as imaging is concerned it's more complex because there is there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of abnormality that we don't understand uh, in detail and also that the clinical correlation to the long term outcomes is lacking hence uh, different uh, different experts have different perspective of, about the same anomaly that creates a lot of confusion amongst practitioners as to how do they counsel the the parents uh, obviously with with the brain um, it's very uh, it's a very sensitive topic and by default um, if the something is not well understood the default position for for many parents is termination which means that there are a lot of normal um, babies that would have had normal outcomes that may have been or that those pregnancies are being ended because of incomplete or lack of understanding of the the anomalies that are probably uh, not very well understood this is where i work i have no uh, conflict of interest to declare uh, as i said uh, there our our job is to correlate the ultrasound images to the actual anatomical uh, uh, structures of the brain and to provide parents with the right type of counseling in fetal medicine uh, whenever we see a neurological abnormality or a suspected abnormality we would always have the pediatric neurologist with us uh, because we as obstetricians or fetal medicine experts do not understand fetal neurology outcomes long term out long term medium term and short term outcomes so we always have a pediatric neurologist in our clinic um uh, and we would not do any counseling without uh, without the help of a pediatric neurologist hence it becomes very important uh, for us to interpret the sonograms uh, correctly to identify the anatomical structures correctly uh, and to distinguish between normal variants of the brain and abnormalities um, unfortunately in the brain there are a number of normal uh, structures uh, and their variants which will uh, mimic uh, like abnormalities and hence it is very important to be absolutely certain of uh, of the variation uh, from abnormalities the fetal as i said i have number of variants that superpose as abnormalities and hence it is important to understand the anatomy and the clinical implications of the variants uh, iso guidelines uh, have very clearly um, highlighted what routine uh, scan planes need to be taken uh, while performing routine uh, anomaly scans at uh, routine the anomaly scans are performed between 18 and 24 weeks and these are the two planes uh, the ventricular plane and the transcerebellar plane uh, and uh, that we look for some uh, practitioners would look at the uh, lateral or the sagittal view to look at the corpus callosum but that's not routine standard practice we would also look at the spine and make sure that the tip of the the spine is visible uh, the spinal integrity is uh, is seen and documented um the structures that we look for one is the cerebral cortex midline uh, evaluation of the anterior and the posterior horn subarachnoid space posterior fossa and the neural tube and i'll try and cover a uh, majority of them except the cerebral cortex because that's uh, pretty much uh, that's a lot in detail so uh, we come to the anterior complex when we look at the anterior complex we particularly look at the uh, the cavum septum pellucidum and the cavum septum pellucidum is uh, is a structure in the anterior half of the brain uh, it's roughly around one millimeter and uh, varies from gestational age um, um, 
केवम सेप्टेम्पल सेटम एंटीरियर हॉर्न एंड इंटर हेमिसफेरिक फिशर दैट दोज आर द थ्री स्ट्रक्चर दैट वी लुक इन द एंटीरियर कॉम्प्लेक्स नाउ एज अट द द केवम सेप्टेम्पल सेडम वेरीज विद जस्टेशनल एज फ्रॉम एटीन टू रफली ट्वेंटी एट वीक्स जस्टेशन looks like a box like structure in the anterior half fluid filled and can be appreciated very clearly however if it is not visualized in the correct plane uh, the anterior fornix may sometimes be uh, missed as the cavum septum pellucidum uh, the cavum septum pellucidum is also uh, also varies with gestational age towards the later gestation it may not be very clearly visible that but that does not mean that the cavum septum pellucidum is absent abnormalities uh, that uh, we look for in the anterior half um, uh, it's very important to make sure that both anterior uh, horns are uh, are completely uh, separate and seen uh, because that that uh, as you can see uh, one of the examples of fused uh, uh, frontal lobes is holoprosen kefeli um, and and some other abnormalities like agenesis of corpus callosum you can see absence of cavum septum pellucidum uh, dilated posterior horn uh, tract like structure in the midline um, that uh, that are very suggestive of an absent cavum septum pellucidum uh then coming to the posterior horn one of the most commonest uh, referrals that uh, any fetal medicine clinic would get is um, is uh, ventricular megaly and there was a problem earlier because we had a cons we had a terminology called as borderline ventricular megaly and um, and that was most of the times over reported um, hence isog and many other organizations have got rid of the term borderline when we say ventricular megaly it is classified mainly as um, the posterior horn being uh, mildly dilated moderately or severely dilated which is divided as 10 to 12 12 to 15 and more than 15 uh, one of the other important uh, consideration while measuring the posterior horn is that the ventricles are placed obliquely and hence it is very important to standardize the right place of measurement of the posterior horn and it is measured uh, at the height of the glomus and uh, and if it is more than 10 mm then it can be uh, it can be mild ventricular megaly uh, mild ventricular megaly can be associated with with chromosomal abnormalities genetic syndromes how the, however mild ventricular megaly is one of the most most um, uh, difficult because majority of the time it is normal uh, and um, and uh, we do not necessarily pick up any abnormality again it could just be a normal variant however moderate and severe ventricular megaly are associated with poor outcomes they can be because of an obstructive lesion or uh, associated with hemorrhage or associated with other brain abnormalities Uh, hence, um, uh, ventricular megaly is uh, evaluation of ventricular megaly is really important, uh, and it is important to do a good uh, good sono sonogram and make sure that the baby that the rest of the brain anatomy is is fine. Uh, this is an example of where we would measure the measure the posterior horn, and uh, it is not measured right. Uh, Uh, in the in the same in the same plane as the lat as the ventricles are placed laterally, um, it needs to be measured uh, in in a way that the entire lateral horn is uh, captured at the height of the glomus, and they measured it's measured perpendicular to the ventricular wall as I said at the level of the parietal uh, ox parieto occipital sulcus and calipers from in to in. ventricular megaly as you all know it is not uh, not a malformation but it is a manifestation of a malformation uh, it asks us to look for other chromos other cns abnormalities look for chromosomes genetics infections and um, and of course it could be a variant of normal uh, in mild cases as fetal medicine experts what we normally do is look at the risk of the background risk of the patient we make sure that we have measured it correctly we look at uh, we talk about invasive testing to check uh, the chromosomes now the question is whether once if you are doing an amniocentesis for mild ventricular megaly whether uh, you would want to do um, just a routine microarray or you would do a whole exome sequences there are new papers that have coming in that if you do whole exome sequencing with mild or moderate ventricular megaly the chances of finding genetic syndromes are much higher than a routine uh, conventional karyotype 
obviously as the brain matures the sulca and the gyri uh, mat change and uh, and you can see as the, the early uh, brain is much more smoother as the brain develops uh, the sulca and gyri uh, develop and that uh, help us stage the maturity of the brain based on the gestational age that we are uh, looking at i would not go into details of the cerebral cortex however uh, the ventricular system is extremely important um, as we said and it correlates very well with the with the with the ventricular megaly part of it uh, cerebrospinal fluid in circulation and if there is uh, any mechanical uh, obstruction uh, so the cerebrospinal fluid as you all know provides mechanical uh, protection intracranial pressure and maintains some important metabolic functions uh, any obstruction to the ventricles uh, uh, whether it's at the level of the aqueduct or it is uh, because of a uh, abnormality in the spine such as the uh, as an open spina bifida can uh, interrupt the circulation of the cerebrospinal fluid leading to ventricular megaly hence it's important to understand the understand the anatomy and look try and look at where the obstruction uh, is sorry this is a long video i will just try and this basically is, uh, shows the uh, brain anatomy and the various foramens through which um, the cerebrospinal fluid leaks abnormality of cortical development as i said as the brain grows in maturity the sulca and the gyri appear and those can be seen very clearly on ultrasound scan uh, we um, the various sulci uh, we use them to uh, to match with the maturity of the baby and that tells us whether the brain maturation is as per the uh, as per the gestational age um, uh, subarachnoid space again the space around the brain uh, it is um, it's a very it's important to uh, make sure that the uh, subarachnoid space is clearly visible uh, because that could be uh, a sign of fetal infection um, and you can see uh, that in infections like CMV uh, there which can be associated with microcephaly the subarachnoid space may be uh, dilated um, it can also be seen on a, a dynamic MRI you can see the first image where the subarachnoid space is much more um, is larger than the normal and of course, uh, microcephaly is uh, something that uh, is um, uh, we need to uh, make sure that the diagnosis is made correctly. Just the head circumference being on the fifth centile does not always mean microcephaly. Uh, microcephaly typically presents um, uh, after 24 to 28 weeks gestation. It's not a diagnosis that can be made very early in uh, very early in pregnancy. And um, uh, uh, having a fetal MR. Uh, MR a study along with an ultrasound uh, image uh, helps us uh, make not only confirm the diagnosis but also look at the cortical ma uh, maturity and other abnormalities that can be associated with microcephaly. Uh, in true microcephaly, the outcome may be um, uh, for the babies baby may be very uh, severe, and hence it is important to make sure that we made the diagnosis correctly. Uh, CMB, especially those happening in the first trimester, are associated with. Uh, small heads or microcephaly, dysgenesis of corpus callosum, um, uh, abnormalities of the cerebral cortex and, and uh, large cerebral space. Um, calcification in the brains can be easily seen in microcephaly. Ventricular megaly, calcified ventricles, uh, additions within the ventricles are some of the manifestations of congenital CMV. And these babies usually have uh, poor outcomes with um, with manifesting as um, epilepsy and convulsions uh, soon after birth. Uh, the next part that we would cover is the midline development of cavities. Three important structures or uh, sort of variations from normal. Cavum septum pellucidum we've already, already discussed. It's a fluid-filled cavity in the anterior part of the brain. Uh, anterior to the corpus callosum. Then we have something called a scabum verge, which is again uh, almost a physiological structure, uh, which can be seen sometimes in babies, which is continuity of the cavum septum pellucidae, um, typically in the middle part of the brain, and cavum villi interpositi, which is posterior to the corpus callosum and separate from cavum septum pellucidum and cavum verge. Uh, cavum villi interposit is more posterior. Uh, there are some papers that uh, suggest it being associated with 
with abnormalities but in most of these cases there is an there is another brain malformation associated isolated camom villi interposity may not necessarily be associated with poor outcome or other abnormalities of course having having a detailed ultrasound and an mr uh, always helps in confirming the diagnosis there is lack of data uh, to correlate camom villi interposity with uh, poor outcome uh, and hence uh, its presence does not always mean uh, that there is uh, there is an abnormality uh, especially if it is an isolated malformation especially if it's not associated with any ventricular megaly or obstruction to the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid uh, and hence good imaging and uh, if in doubt we can always uh, take um, the help of uh, of of an mri the, this is how it would appear on the on the on the ultrasound of course if uh, the cavity or the cyst becomes larger and can and it can cause ventricular megaly due to obstruction of the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid and hence may have implications in the postnatal period uh, but we would obviously always have the pediatric neurologist helping us um, counsel the parents um, uh, with regards to this, the vein of Gallen is displaced posteriorly, uh, typically in cavum villi interpositi, um, and that is how it helps us in making the diagnosis. Uh, the third structure that we're going to cover, which is in the posterior part of the brain, is the cerebellum, the smaller structure, but one of the most important structures as far as the outcome is concerned. We routinely measure the cerebellum and the vermis. Uh, we look at the vermis. We don't measure the vermis. We measure the transcerebellar diameter routinely and look for the presence of the vermis on a routine ultrasound scan. Um, uh, this is These are the sections that we would normally take. If in doubt, we would then look at the vermis and measure the vermis. There are nomograms available to measure the vermis uh, because an, um, an abnormality in the vermis can have severe implications on the baby. Um, this is the way this is how the uh, anatomical cerebellum and the vermis looks like looks on the on an ultrasound scan anteriorly bounded by the fourth ventricle and posteriorly by the cisterna magna uh, and uh, so I'm not sure if you can see the spore squid thing. This is how uh, uh, agents of uh, vermis can appear on, on the ultrasound scan. Um, embryology of the posterior fossa, the cerebellum, uh, it's important in, to uh, recognize that is found on the top of a very large fourth ventricle and in time the cerebellum uh, grows caudally and then enfolds the cavity of the fourth ventricle. can you see my slides moving? Dr. Mandeep, uh, the last slide Abhi. is not well moved. Last slide, Neem. Can you stop sharing and uh, share again? Can you it was the... all well. You know, this nothing is black. Can you just stop sharing for a moment and then share your screen again? Uh, Asmita, can you help? Can you suggest? Asmita? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm just. Uh, so you can reshare your screen. I have stopped your sharing. Hello? Yeah, he stopped. He stopped, Asmita. Yeah. Yeah, sir has a low bandwidth. Show the low bandwidth. I think it's a problem with the internet with Mandeep. The problem is with the bandwidth yes. must be very, very low. Yes. The videos are not working. Yeah, 
we got locked out. Anyway, till till the time, Mandeep again. Uh, yeah, you please, mind. Dr. Prashant, you can, Dr. Prashant Acharya, you can you add on, you can just. Yeah. Uh, you, there are there are there are still many things, much better things can be seen and appreciated on feet ultrasound. Now it is like a classical example is a guideline. Any Western world which produces guidelines. So can you switch on your video? So I it will look better on the screen. Thanks, thanks. Uh, in the Western world, the problem is with all, all those guidelines. We will tell you that what minimum, basic minimum things which is required. Okay. And in India, that is not that is not sufficient. You have to give your, you are, you are, you will be always surpassing those guidelines and you will try to, if, if at all you know the subject, you will go much beyond the, the, than what the guideline says. So actual fetal brain assessment uh, with a new tool and new technology with a tool, uh, recent equipments, they are brilliant, amazing. Uh, in fact, the ultrasound will give you far more information before 24 weeks of gestation than MRI. After 24 weeks, because the skull gets ossified, then the MRI may take over the ultrasound. That, that is what before 24 weeks, it is an ultrasound which will give you probably better information than, than actually the MRI. So that's where in India, because the, the the gestation limit is a 24 week before that you can you can you can choose to terminate the pregnancy so we have to think in that line first that at 22 to 23 week that's the best time but first trimester 12 week or 13 week of a pregnancy where majority of the of, of the fetal brain malformation can be suspected so so at at 14 week or 13 or 14 week of a gestation where the first trimester fetal neurosonogram it's a new different entity so, so we we have to think in that line also that okay, a twelve week or a thirteen week evaluation rather than only only uh, twenty to twenty four week of gestation because you don't get yeah, Mandeep is there. Please, Mandeep, go ahead, share. Yeah, I'm I'm very sorry. Give me one second. I'm just going to open my presentation and. Dr. Mandeep, New York may be connectivity issue hota hai. Bula, Hindustan mein hota hai. <laughs> uh, Can you see the slides now? Yeah, uh, first slide again. Full screen nahi hai. I'm just going to um, go back to my where I left. Can you see my slide? And this is where we, I think we left was um, we we're looking at the agenesis of um, the uh, cerebellum or a hypoplasia of the cerebellum. Um, you can see that on the on the scan on the scan. Uh, uh, embryology of the posterior fossa, small cerebellum that then grows cordially and enfolds the cavity of the fourth ventricle. Um, these are the various uh, changes that uh, the posterior fossa undergoes in um, as the gestation advances. And hence, it is important to visualize the cerebellum in the correct plane. Otherwise, uh, structures may not may appear to be missing, which uh, may not necessarily be missing. The same goes for scans at around 36 weeks, because if we are not in the right plane and if we are more uh, posterior, you may see you may see a deep sulcus, which uh, which may mimic like an uh, absence of the vermis. Um, some of the abnormalities like Blake Pouch cyst. Uh, uh, which is like a small finger-like projection uh, out, uh, of the fourth ventricle caudal to the cerebellar vermis, frequently found and is typically seen in the small circle uh, within the cisterna magna. Uh, the Blake's pouch cyst can sometimes be confused as agenesis of vermis if the cerebellum is not um, very well um, uh, uh, visualized or not very well scanned. It is it is easy to see the vermis if you uh, if you scan uh, more anteriorly uh, and and that can avoid a false diagnosis. Uh, the Blake's pouch expansion basically pushes the uh, cerebellum anteriorly and causes the rotation of the vermis. 
uh, for reasons not completely understood, the pouch may undergo expansion as a result of the increased size of cisterna magna may appear uh, to be posterior to the cerebellum. It displaces the cerebellum posterior superiorly, uh, separating it from the brain anatomy. And this is also sometimes referred as uh, cerebellar rotation. Um, uh, as I said, uh, a large cisterna magna may sometimes be confused as um, an agenesis of vermis. It can sometimes be labeled as a mega cisterna magna or a dandy walker syndrome or a complex which may be a dandy walker or a variant of dandy walker. In dandy walker, there are three main uh, features. One is the uh, abnormality of the vermis. Second is the appearance of the cyst, uh, which, um, which may be encompassing the uh, the entire uh, vermis. It is important to be sure uh, um, that we are not confusing in Blake's pouch cyst to a uh, dandy walker malformation. Uh, there, there, if you look at the history of um, of how dandy walker malformation has been described, that has itself undergone changes because now we can image the cerebellum better by using CTs or MRIs. However, um, the definition of it needs to encompass all the three uh, components, the cyst, uh, the abnormality of the vermis uh, to be uh, labeled as a dandy walker complex. Uh, the cerebellum can be visualized uh, in both the planes. Uh, it is, uh, and can and we can use uh, MRIs to, to visualize the cerebellum correctly. Uh, two fissures, three lobes, and the festigium of fourth ventricle uh, visible clearly helps us differentiate from the normal to an abnormal um, cerebellum. The vermis, as I said, there are normograms available to measure the vermis to make sure that it's of the right size. Uh, it is. It can be seen as an echogenic tissue uh, between the two cerebellar hemispheres, uh, anteriorly bound by the fourth ventricle um, and, uh, and, and posteriorly by the cisterna magna. Uh, we uh, call cisterna magna as mega cisterna magna when it is more than uh, 10 millimeters um, and we have excluded other abnormalities. One of the ways of uh, differentiating between Blake's pouch cyst and a dandy walker malformation is the uh, brainstem vermis angle uh, and this is how we can use that uh, to grade the vermis rotation to differentiate uh, different pathologies of the posterior fossa. And there's a nice normogram that uh, uh, that elicits how the angle uh, is different for different pathologies, less than around 20 for normal, increases in break pouch cyst, and is more than 40 in uh, dandy walker malformation. Um, it's important to assess the integrity of the vermis to, um, on a on a scan um, to make sure that the that we have. Um, we have anatomically defined the entire cerebellum and the vermis. So coming back to the posterior fossa, some of the lesions of the posterior fossa are Blake's pouch cyst, mega cisterna magna, and dandy walker syndrome. Um, as you can see the findings, uh, Blake's pouch cyst, there is an upward rotation of the intact vermis in mega cisterna magna. Uh, we define uh, as cisterna magna more than 10 millimeters with a normally positioned cerebellum in dandy walker syndrome upward rotation of the vermis with an elevated torcula which uh, also you can, we can use the bv angle to define that vermin hypoplasia is a hypoplastic vermis with normal torcula uh, cerebellar hypoplasia is a large cisterna magna with small cerebellum and posterior fossa arachnoid cysts are usually uh, not in midline, but are cysts with mass effect, resulting in distortion of the cerebellum. Small arachnoid cysts may have no implications. However, if they are compressing on the adjacent cerebral cortex or uh, or causing ventricular megaly, then they may they may have some implications. These are the scans of Blake's pouch cyst, dandy walker malformation. You can see the vermis being absent in the midline, mega cisterna magna and a worm in hypoplasia. Now coming to the spinal cord, uh, closed spina bifida. Um, I will talk about open spina bifida in the next part. Uh, closed spina bifida uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, is sometimes a very complex presentation for a fetal medicine expert because you do not see the typical Arnold-Ki malformation and you see a, 
a, a sort of defect in the spine, very low. Um, and the problem for uh, is how do you counsel them uh, for the implications of spina bifida? A large number of uh, fetal medicine experts would or practitioners would do exactly the same counseling for open or closed spina bifida, which we all know is not or is not uh, true. Uh, open spina bifida and closed spina bifida are two different pathologies and behave very differently. However, the diagnosis of a uh, closed spina bifida early is important to um, to make sure that the that the treatment is early and prevents deterioration due to tethering of the cord. Uh, the spinal cord can be very well visualized on scan, and hence this is a diagnosis that is not um, we should not miss. Uh, we also visualize the spine in in the sagittal plane, make sure that there is no hemivertebra. Uh, there's no scoliosis because that can cause sometimes um, uh, pressure on the, or compression on the spinal cord in the later half of the life. Um, I'm just going to change my um, uh, stop sharing and I'm going to share the next part of my slides. Uh, uh, can you see my slides now? Uh, no, sir, you yeah. have stopped the sharing. Please reshare your screen. Okay. Uh, go back to the Zoom window, sir. Yes. One second. I'm just going to uh, start sharing the presentation on um, on the on open spina bifida. We know that open spina bifida uh, till today, um, we, um, we, we only- uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but the screen is not shared yet. And now it's coming. Yeah, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, so the uh, prevalence of open spina bifida varies from geographical region um, uh, across the world. Some areas of the world have, uh, higher incidence of spina bifida. It may be linked to uh, nutrition deficiency of folic acid, but this is an abnormality that is uh, that is more commonly seen in fetal medicine. Open spina bifida can be easily diagnosed uh, on uh, routine scans. We uh, we look at the cervical. We look at the spine from the cervical to the sacral region and look at the integrity of the spinal um, of the spine by visualizing the intact screen uh, skin. Associated uh, kyphoscoliosis can also be easily diagnosed on sagittal scans. Now, spina bifida can be diagnosed very early. Um, most of most commonly, they are seen in the lumbosacral region or the sacral region. Uh, we use brain normally would we would measure the brainstem to brainstem occipital ratio uh, or, or in the first trimester. That helps us suspect an open spina bifida. And if an open spina bifida is suspected or if it is a large defect, then it can be seen early or otherwise it can be seen towards the later half of the, uh, 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 roughly at around 16 weeks. Uh, we know that as the brain and the, uh, is uh, because of the spina bifida, the cerebellum can get pulled and the cerebellum that is normally seen as a, as a dumbbell shaped structure uh, looks like a banana and hence that is called as a banana sign. A sign. Also there is a uh, scaffolding of the anterior fontanelle and that gives a, a sign of uh, it, the skull appears like a lemon. So a lemon and a banana sign at uh, in at around 16 weeks or later than that is pretty much um, uh, uh, has a very high correlation with presence of an open spina bifida. Uh, when we look at spina bifidas per se, they can be associated with chromosomal abnormalities, uh, diabetes, or associated drugs. 
non chromosomal syndromes may be low uh, may be risk may be low as i said we could uh, diagnose most of the spina bifida on ultrasound fetal karyotyping can is only suggested in the presence of other abnormalities or if we are going to do an intervention however the problem is that the 5 year mortality rate is about 35% 20% of the babies die within the first 12 months about 25% babies are still born surviving babies have paralysis of the lower limb double incontinence despite associated uh, hydrocephalus uh, uh, intelligence may often be normal there is a risk of baby uh, next pregnancy uh, recurrence uh, however high dose folic acid supplementation of around 5 mg per day in the preconception period reduces the risk by almost 75% now one of the problems with uh, spina bifida is um, the double uh, the the affection of the bowel and bladder because of the damage of the spinal cord where it is open it also leads to talipes muscle wasting and the severity of the damage may depend upon the le level of the lesion because of the pulling of the cerebellum um, uh, you can see hind brain uh, herniation brain stem abnormalities the cerebellum always appears smaller may not necessarily because of cerebellar hypoplasia but because it is pulled down into the into the um, foramen magnum uh, associated hydrocephalus uh, presenting as an arnold chiari 2 malformation uh, and these babies would often need ventricular peritoneal shunt. Uh, the two hit theory, one is because there is damage because of the failure of the neural tube. And the second hit is um, as pregnancy advances, the, the spinal cord or the dorsal ganglia can be seen to be eroding because of hemorrhage, uh, uh, hemorrhage or abrasion or um, uh, hydrostatic pressure of the uterus contracting uh, throughout pregnancy. And you can see the images from number A to number H as pregnancy advances the dorsal ganglia, uh, uh, there is considerable loss of the spinal tissue uh, as pregnancy grows. And this is now, this is almost irreversible leading to damage to the uh, bowel and bladder and lower limbs. Now, the reason why we're talking about is because of this trial, which you very well know is known as called as the MOMS study. This was done between 2003 and 2010 uh, in the United States uh, among some centers um, and it was reported in 2013 which compared the efficacy of in utero uh, repair to uh, standard postnatal repair. The inclusion criteria were uh, pretty uh, strict and well-defined. Um, the Arnold Chiari malformation was mandatory, T1 to S1 lesions, uh, isolated abnormalities, and what this showed is that when an in utero neural tube defect repair is performed as compared to the standard postnatal repair, there is a 40% reduction in the need for a ventricular peritoneal shunt. There is a 30% reduction in hindbrain herniation. The motor function was twice better as compared to the postnatal standard repair and the ability to walk independently was twi twice as much better. However, in utero repair is also associated with its own problems. Uh, we open the uterus, hence that causes a scar on the uterus. There is a risk of scar de thinning or rupture. Uh, the membranes are a challenge to manage. Uh, there is a risk of uh, rupture of membrane, reduced liquor volume uh, due to leaking. And of course, 50% of these women may, are, uh, may deliver before uh, 34 weeks gestation and hence the risk of preterm delivery. The technique of in utero closure is exactly the same as we would do postnatally. Um, we would open the abdomen uh, as a routine cesarean section. We would map the placenta uh, because we don't want to be taking incision close to the placenta. Then open the uterus and I will show you a video of this. We open the uterus, um, we identify the amniotic membrane, we make a small hole in the amniotic membrane, collect the amniotic fluid. Then uh, uh, we expose the baby's back the neurosurgeons come in, the pediatric neurosurgeon would repair the uh, open spina bifida exactly as they would do in the postnatal period. Once this is done, we would then close the amniotic membrane along with the first layer of the uterus and uh, then close the rest of the layers of the uterus. Uh, uh, where while we're closing, we put the amniotic fluid back uh, so that, um, and, and then uh, come out. Um, we um, then monitor these pregnancies every weekly for the first three weeks and then every two weeks till uh, they go into labor. Delivery is by cesarean section. I'm just going to play a short video of how we do the uh, repair. 
uh, it's a it's a longish incision uh, the uterus is then delivered and once the uterus is delivered we then start mapping the placenta so we know exactly where the placenta is because we want don't want to be close to the placenta we try and remain three centimeters away from the placenta and i'm just going to forward this um, we give the baby uh, anesthetic and a muscle relaxant so that the baby doesn't feel the pain and is easy to manipulate once this has been done we then try and uh, move the baby by something called as a jumping technique now in the jumping technique what we do is we try and move the baby's back exactly at the site where we want to take the incision we would normally take the incision in the midline of the uterus because that's the least vascular plane so uh, manipulating the baby to put the back and the lesion exactly at the place where we want the incision to be taken is important once we have done that and that can sometimes be a longish procedure we take uh, two um, stay sutures so that we have now defined the area where we would want to uh, take uh, the incision once that is done uh, we make an incision using the cautery and then slowly dissect the layers of the uterus And you can see that that being done, we then um, enlarge the, uh, we're very careful not to rupture the membranes because we want to collect the amniotic fluid uh, very carefully. And you can see the amniotic membrane bulging out of the incision. So once we see that, we hold the amniotic membrane. We collect the amniotic fluid. Once that's collected, uh, that's the neurosurgeon uh, coming in. The neurosurgeon would do the routine repair, uh, three layer repair. Uh, they would uh, use the Dura patch for the first layer. Once the once the uh, sac is uh, being open, uh, they would um, close the sac, uh, put a patch, then bring the muscle um, in the second layer and the skin in the third layer. And you can see this, uh, the baby's back being closed and it's almost coming together. And once that is done, we keep an um, tube inside the uterus and close the first layer of the uterus along with the amniotic membranes. Hence, our incidence of rupture membrane is lower because we suture the membranes back. In the fetoscopic technique, where we do not use an incision, but we use the fetoscopes directly, it's very difficult to close the membranes well. And hence, the risk of rupture membrane and preterm labor is higher in those cases. Then we um, put the amniotic fluid back and suture the uterus in three layers. Number of centers across the world uh, are doing in utero repair. Uh, we are based in, in Abu Dhabi and uh, we have uh, in the last 12 months done around eight uh, open spina bifida repairs, all of uh, pretty much successfully and our outcomes uh, very well um, correlate with those of the, of the international cent centers. Now, I'm not trying to say that uh, all uh, uh, spina bifida should be treated by any neutro surgery. However, parents, who very well are aware of the option of termination, do not want termination of pregnancy and would want to continue pregnancy. In those cases only, in utero repair is better than the conventional postnatal repair because it has the potential of improving the quality of life for the baby by reducing the risk incidence of ventricular peritoneal shunt, improving the bowel and bladder function and improving the power of the lower limbs. Hence, it is important uh, to not confuse. We are not talking about cure of spina bifida here. We are talking about almost palliation in, in whatever way we can. Uh, we always underestimate the, the, the choices of the parents because sometimes we almost impose our views on the parents and make decisions for them, which is probably not the right thing. If the parents would want to continue pregnancy for various reasons, because of religious reasons or whether if it's if they're old and if this is the only chance that they could have a baby or if they want to continue with pregnancy, then we need to be we need to support them. 
and we need to be able to give them these choices. And of course, there are centers who can do this, who this uh, do these results better. And it is important for these centers to make sure that the results are available for anybody who wants to see them. Uh, Future, again, uh, fetoscopic technique is gradually undergoing um, improvements, uh, use of robotics. I don't know how much that would help, but there are centers who are doing it. We are constantly improving the patches that we're using. There are stem cell patches available for repair of spina bifida. Uh, and of course, we want to try and close the spinal cord as quickly as possible. Currently, we, uh, we repair, perform the repair between 24 and 26 weeks gestation because before that, it is difficult for us to, uh, for the skin to hold the sutures well. However, with improvement in sutures, uh, maybe there is, uh, there would be scope for us to, um, to do the repair earlier so that we can avoid any damage to the spinal cord. Um, as I said, robotic assisted fetoscopic surgery is on the horizon, but not sure how much it would add value to it. Um, and this is regarding um, a, a brief uh, run of um, of all the spine, um, uh, common CNS anomalies. I'm sure I have, I have missed some of them and um, spina bifida and uh, a procedure of an open uh, spina bifida repair. Uh, thank you. Dr. Shifali? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Juhi, I thought you will take over. Dr. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandeep, sir, for this so informative talk, so systematic. Each uh, topic was covered so much in detail. Uh, so uh, since we don't have any questions yet, I think, ma'am, we can, should we move forward to the next talk? No, 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 no. Uh, Dr. Uh, Prashant Acharya, I uh, would like to uh, have your comments and... Uh, and meanwhile, uh, I actually, I'm sorry we did, I did not write because Mahesh always writes that everybody should put their question and answer in the Q&A. Uh, today I'm missing him because he's, he's traveling, he's in the US currently and I forgot to write. So please post your questions in the Q&A, please. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Prashant, can you please make your comments, please? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you Mandi, for, for presentation. And uh, he has highlighted some of the basic uh, fetal CNS malformations which are possibly diagnosed. And now, now it's a question of advanced neurosonogram. It's not only the diagnosis, but it is about the diagnosing them earlier and prognosticating better, ruling out the genetic malformations, ruling out associated genetic causes or other associated causes, try to prevent these malformations uh, in, in, in her next pregnancy. So the counseling is now based not, not only for the outcome of these present malformation. It goes, it stretches towards for, for the next pregnancy also. So it, it's all about uh, the fetal neurosonogram is not only for the diagnosis of a present malformation, but it also include and, and it should include probably, and where we probably as an obstetrician or a fetal medicine specialist, we need your help. As those, because you are, you are the one who are trying to treat those those newborns and, and pediatric group. And uh, if at all, you help us in identifying and investi investigating this index cases much more in detail with whole exome sequencing and high resolution microarray. Because low resolution microarray is, is, is merely like a better karyotype. If at all, you are really interested in identifying the micro deletions, it is a 750K uh, microarray and whole exome sequencing. Because whole exam sequencing still in India or across the globe, it will take four to five weeks. And usually patient comes quite late in, in the gestation, not exactly in the first time. So we don't have, we don't have the, those five extra week to investigate the index case. That's where the problem is. And I think you, you all as a pediatric neurologist can help us in investigating the index cases. And that would be a great help for, for any fetal medicine specialist. Not, not only for us, it's about, uh, about the patient care that would be really great helpful. And now, uh, better technology is available. And with a transvaginal scan at 14 week or 15 week or first at the end of the first trimester, you see a lot of brain far more accurately, probably equally accurate. The problem with the fetal neurology imaging is that it is constantly evolving. At 13 week, the anatomy is different. My ultrasound becomes different. And at 22 week, it is different. And at 34 week, it is different. So, 
we have to have a precise information at what gestation we are evaluating. And it, it is not like, like heart. Heart may be similar at 10 week or it is same at 40 week. Uh, for the brain, for, for, for pediatric neurologist, it is the brain which remains same. It doesn't get more more developed, except maybe sulci, some part of sulci and gyri, which will have more, more evolution. But in the fetal brain, it is constantly evolving or, or developing embryologically every every month or every 15 days. So these are the few things about what we come across, some difficulties, and some of the things where, where you as a pediatric neuro, uh, neurologist, you can help everyone to the patient and that, that, to the couple. That's what my comment is from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinar. What about from Turkey? Uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for your fantastic uh, presentation with all, uh, lots of uh, visualization and uh, videos, Dr. Uh, Mandip. Yes, as, as he uh, mentioned, uh, uh, I agree with him. Uh, uh, brain is a big topic and uh, with uh, complex uh, structure. And also Dr. Uh, Prashant uh, said that this uh, developing uh, process and it it um, differs week of weeks and then um, as uh, pediatric uh, neurology perspective um, the uh, family want to know the um, long term uh, neuro developmental uh, outcome of of their babies of course uh, and we uh, we should uh, say uh, something uh, about this, and with with all with all this uh, in uh, in uh, direct uh, findings uh, features of this uh, 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 sinus abnormalities uh, due to fetal uh, ultrasonography uh, or maybe uh, uh, MRI. And uh, usually, it's it, um, it is it is so uh, difficult to uh, say, and uh, we need some uh, help, as Doctor uh, uh, Prashant uh, said. Um, I think uh, whole exome uh, sequencing is more um, useful uh, technique to say uh, something uh, about. Um, uh, etiology of this abnormality of uh, CNS and uh, maybe it is uh, syndromic, maybe it's it's not. Uh, we can say, uh, we can uh, not say uh, at this point um, if if we, uh, we have not um, uh, information uh, about uh, genetics or um, macroarray uh, features and I think it's it uh, will be um, routine and, uh, uh, performing uh, array or uh, whole exome uh, sequencing in the uh, fetal uh, period in the future. I thought that this, will come in the next talk. Yeah, useful. Dr. Shagun will be yeah. taking. Dr. Shagun will be taking that. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Shubha, will uh, what is the? You have so much experience of so many years, ma'am. Can you share uh, what you have felt uh, in India, Dr. Shubha Fitke? Uh, hello. Uh, a very interesting talk and uh, informative. Uh, as uh, we know that the brain keeps on not only growing in size, but it keeps on developing different structures at different time points. So whatever at whatever gestation you do ultrasonography, there may be more surprises even if you say this is normal at 14 weeks. So there may be some things which may appear a little later and that for, for that we have to be uh, prepared and um, then that is why the uh, ultrasound at the later date in the second trimester is very important. But the most important challenging point is that many things will appear after 24 weeks, which is our um, gestation age for termination according to Indian law. And that is going to happen. And then these findings, ultrasonographers and the imaging technology has evolved so much that the findings are very correct. So uh, structural diagnosis is very correct. 
but the outcome is so markedly variable from absolutely normal outcome regarding cognitive function to severe disability. And um, for one tool is cytogenetic microarray for which we can get a um, report within a week's time. But uh, still the uncertainty remains if these reports are normal. So the, now the challenge before the imaging specialist is that if you find out aplasia of corpus callosum, can you get some more imaging clues which will differentiate from those with normal cognitive function, which are probably 80% and those who have something definitely poor outcome. So that challenge continues to remain and that uh, more and more data will keep on appearing. So if we can differentiate at these and make a very certain uh, uh, information about the counseling that the patients will be benefited. So on one side, for making the definite uh, outcome, one is very quick um, exam sequencing in one go, which can look at the copy number variations. And we don't have to do microarray now. So if we can give rapid exam, whole exam sequencing with copy number variation together, that is one way. Other way that even if these are normal, there will be maybe those cases with poor outcome regarding cognitive function and then some more neuroimaging things which can be picked up on microarray uh, on uh, a fetal MRI or ultrasonography. So that probably uh, is the thing which we are looking forward to so that though we can differentiate the outcome and decide uh, who will have better better outcome and encourage the families to continue those pregnancies with a definite ultrasonographic abnormalities, but likely to have good outcome, like mild ventriculomically. Same way, there are so many findings which are little subtle and uh, the uh, challenge in counseling remains. Prashant, you want to say anything? Prashant Jauri, you want to say something quickly? And then I think we can have the questions after Dr. Shagun speaks. Hai na? Uh, Prashant, you can say, and Dr. Shagun, you can be ready to share your screen. Yeah. Meanwhile, you can start sharing your screen, in fact, Dr. Shagun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Prashant. Prashant, you're mute. Am I audible? Now, yes. Okay, so I was just saying, I just had one question maybe to Dr. Mandeep and to Dr. Acharya as well. It is just an extension of what Shubha ma'am was saying. So uh, when you say when you say that it is an isolated ventriculomegaly, so what would be the key things that you are looking at when you say that, yes, it is an isolated, so that we can, as a pediatric neurologist, we can have, we can have some sort of a planning, key, okay, if it is completely clean and there's no other abnormality, then we can at least give some sort of a, a positive counseling to the family. So what would be those few things that you would definitely want to see ventricular lining and what other issues? Uh, and the, the other part of my question would be, in our experience, we now don't see so many infections being a cause of ventriculomegaly. So is do you guys see ventriculomegaly secondary to CMB and other CNS infections so commonly or gradually this is slightly fading away in, even in our setup as well. I'll, I'll tell you one thing. When when I say isolated borderline or uh, isolated ventricular megaly, I have ruled out all fetal causes which can be diagnosed by on, on uh, ultrasound. Second, I have done MRI. I have ruled out any associated possible diagnosed uh, diagnostic help from MRI. Third, I have done micro array high resolution i have done whole exome sequencing i have also ruled out fetal infection once i have ruled out everything then i'll call it as an isolated borderline ventricular megaly where there are 93 percent chances of a good outcome see in india i am not worried about those 93 percent they will always feel that okay it's our good luck that everything was fine everything has went well i'm worried about those seven percent when something went wrong with those 7%, they'll come to you and say, doctor, you told us to continue the pregnancy and now we are having these kind of problems. So it's about, for us, it is always should be non-directed counseling that look, 93% are going to be good, but 7%, there are going to be some issues. You have to accept that and continue the pregnancy if you want. The counseling has to be that way. And your next question was uh, about, uh, I forgot your uh, second question, uh, CMV infection. 
yes i do agree that in india the cmb infection is is probably the, the the infective infection as a cause of ventricular megaly is is coming really low the chances are very less for the fetal infection but still as a protocol we need to do evaluate the fetal infection also so sir that means that as a take home message you would want to say that any child with any cns abnormality no matter how subtle it is you would want to go ahead with an extensive genetic evaluation yes because i do not want to give a child with the, where the conditions are not treatable these all genetic malformations are not treatable you can't do anything so for me i will not give any child tomorrow they should not come to you and say doctor you you should have if at all you would have informed me we would have done the investigation and and we would have no, not been this this scenario so rule out all those are not treatable those who who cannot be treated so that's what as a clinician that's what my aim should be yeah sorry dr I prashant think dr uh, mandeep think, yeah. yeah i think we would slightly vary um, and i think uh, that's probably the way like in the uk would do a normal good anomaly scan a good neurosonograph uh, make sure that there is no cns abnormality we do routine tort screening because it's not very expensive in the uk it costs around 1 and 1/2 pounds to do a tort screen uh, so i know yes the chances of us finding us finding a fetal infection are low uh, and if the if there are no fetal signs then it's unlikely but it's a easy test to be done so we do that uh, we would offer an amniocentesis or a cvs or an amniocentesis and do a routine microarray we would not do an exome sequencing though there is no new evidence that it might help but not in our clinical practice the other important thing is is we are talking about mild ventricular megaly and we would follow these ba these uh, babies in the spring in the pregnancy every four weekly in a large number of cases the ventricular megaly resolves and those are good uh, prognosticating ind indicators we would only do an mri if the ventricular megaly was to increase in the subsequent scans this is uh, the practice that we've done in the uk and uh, and across so a uh, slightly different from dr prashant's uh, because you can terminate the pregnancy by giving intracardiac potassium chloride even at 38 week of gestation which is not allowed in india so no, i don't think it's about uh, termination of pregnancy uh, so it's nobody about, would want that, to terminate pregnancy eventually if something goes wrong very wrong mm -hmm. at the end of you do not know at 24 week it may be different at 34 week it may go sir really i think low. sir i think we'll give dr shagun this thing and we can take off the questions and this discussion because there's a lot of interest on ventricular megaly if you see in the q and a so we'll come back yeah. to this and take it on and give dr shagun the uh, this thing you know otherwise uh, i think this is a very important thing what we see actually uh, ventricular megaly for all pediatric neurology so there are so many questions sir so i'm sorry i just uh, said dr uh, shagun please please yeah okay So good evening, everyone. So I hope the slides are visible, right? So I'll go ahead. Yes. So yeah. So we've already, I mean, had uh, many viewpoints and uh, I mean, a discussion on uh, both the imaging aspects, the counseling, and uh, you know, the genetic evaluation to some extent, and how there is some difference in practice uh, in different settings. So let me just uh, kind of know. I would probably go through some basic. Uh, uh concepts and then just show some cases and uh, try to kind of uh, bring it all together to say that how practically we could approach uh, a case and how this kind of genetic evaluation would be useful in a specific scenario so again uh, i mean because it's such a vast topic we of course cannot cover all the anomalies or all the scenarios but it's just to give a kind of a basic uh, approach kind of a thing so that we at least start thinking in the right direction so of course this is i mean this everybody would be familiar with so yes cns anomalies are pretty common and are indeed one of the commonest anomalies we see both prenatally and at birth and in fact in india we are still uh, dealing with neural tube defects as uh, more around uh, half of the cns anomalies which we see and this is in fact a paper from uh, dr shubhas group only so um this of course all of you would be familiar with so there are certain uh, key events which are occurring during the fetal brain development and uh, interruption of these events um, at various period of gestation due to genetic or non genetic causes give rise to the different spectrum of anomalies so the key events of course first is the neurulation then the ventral induction and then the migration and then of course the proliferation and myelination 
and uh, other uh, uh, events which keep on occurring right till term and even some of them, of course, even after birth. So um, in the neurolation abnormalities uh, are, would be the earliest abnormalities and these would basically result in the various spectrum of the neural tube defects, whereas when we have the induction abnormalities, these primarily cause the midline defects or so the severest or the earliest abnormality uh, which would happen would be the holoprosen carefully and then we would have go on to the milder spectrum where we have the corpus callosum agenesis or just an absent C, uh, CSP. And then of course the migration abnormalities and the proliferation maturation myel myelination abnormalities which can occur throughout gestation almost. So these give rise to the various cortical developmental defects, which could be a problem in uh, proliferation that would be the microcephaly or megalencephaly, or it could be a problem in the migration, which would be the lysencephaly, polymicrogyria and the other anomalies. And of course, we have the other uh, problems, uh, ventricular septum defect, uh, sorry, ventricular system defects, posterior fossa defects and the miscellaneous findings, which could be there. And many of them could be acquired and things like soft markers uh, in the brain, like uh, choroid plexus cyst and all. Now we know that they are not in isolation of uh, much significance. So uh, etiology is, of course, uh, we can't forget the infections and uh, other um, acquired events, but we are going to focus today on the genetic etiologies. And these uh, genetic etiologies are really important because um, in two ways primarily. So when we are prenatally dealing with a situation where we have a fetus with a CNS finding, so many of them, like we've just discussed things like uh, a mild ventricular megaly or isolated corpus callosum agenesis, when the majority of this would go on to actually have a good outcome. And uh, so these, uh, in such a situation when we are facing with such a, faced with such a scenario, it's important to uh, do the genetic workup because in case this finding is because of an underlying genetic etiology, then this particular case would go on to be a relatively, uh, it would go on to a poor prognosis situation. So we can kind of uh, distinguish uh, at least to some extent some of the cases uh, by doing a genetic workup especially in situations where you have uh, findings which are not always a poor outcome findings. So there, this really helps the family in kind of taking a decision for continuing the pregnancy because once your genetic workups comes out to be normal and then in the case of, let's say, mild ventricular megaly or isolated corpus callosum agenesis, we do the serial scans or the MRI, things keep on looking okay, then that's a really, I mean, a situation where we are likely to have a, a good outcome. So prenatally, yes, it helps and uh, in the accurate prognostication and also if you have a poor prognosis finding, uh, let's say a holoprosen kefli or probably an encephalocele, where yes, the family would be terminating there also the genetic workup helps because it tells you about the cases which are likely to recur in subsequent pregnancies. So I mean, these are the two kind of, I would say, the key points uh, which we need to keep in mind. Um, that th That's why we are doing the genetic workup. So, of course, the other things have already been covered. So, the counseling basically focuses uh, on the finding per se and its outcome. And then the other part is the genetic workup. So, now uh, just to uh, cover some very basic concepts of genetics, because just to this gives us an idea about what kind of uh, genetic abnormalities uh, could be there which could be presenting with the CNS abnormality and what test we should be doing for which situation or which scenario. So broadly, we can classify the genetic uh, aberrations into three types. One, there could be a problem in the number or, uh, or a gross structural abnormality in the chromosome. So these we called as the chromosomal disorders. So like trisomy 13, 18, 21. So all these are numerical chromosomal disorders. This can be easily picked by doing a karyotype. But yes, in certain scenarios for rapid diagnosis, we used other techniques like QFPCR, MLPA. And when we are trying to look at additional things, we also use microarray. So these are the, uh, the we would say, one of the commoner uh, conditions and one of the conditions for which an easy, simple, cheap test is available. Then we have the problems which could arise because there is a small uh, kind of aberration in the chromosome, but it's too tiny to be seen in a karyotype. So we can't see it under the microscope. So we call these as a sub-microscopic copy number abnormalities. This could be deletions or duplications. 
So here we need to do certain molecular cytogenetic tests and the test of choice in majority of scenario, uh, especially for a CNS abnormality would be a chromosomal microarray because uh, we most of the times we would not have a specific uh, micro deletion or micro duplication in my mind. So we would be doing a kind of a genome wide uh, assay. So chromosomal microarray basically tells, uh, looks at all these copy number defects across the genome. And then finally, the third kind of defect is when there is a problem at the level of the DNA and we could have a, a change in even a single base of a DNA. So here the test which we need to do, uh, so these are the single gene disorders also called as Mendelian disorders, monogenic disorders. Here we need to sequence the DNA to actually find the uh, genetic uh, abnormality. This could be done by Sanger sequencing. Again, in prenatal scenario, there would be hardly any situation where Sanger sequencing would be useful because we don't, this is a very targeted test. So what we typically used is a next generation sequencing. So just to again tell a bit about these tests. So these are basically now whatever names I mentioned, the karyotype, the microarray and the sequencing, these are nothing but basically test of increasing resolution. So when we are doing a karyotype, we are looking grossly at the chromosome and maybe some huge, large defect in the chromosome, uh, um, which could be picked up. Whereas when I'm doing a microarray, I'm trying to look further in more depth or more high resolution within the chromosome. Whereas when I'm doing a sequencing, I'm re reading the actual DNA sequence. So um, this is, I mean, just a picture. A, a picture of uh, a karyotype, how it looks like, where we can see all the chromosomes, we can check their numbers, look for any gross structural defects. So karyotype is a very, we could say it's a genome-wide test because it looks at all the chromosomes, but it's a very zoomed out kind of a view. So it's like, you know, putting a Google map and trying to uh, look at the city of Hyderabad. So it's an extremely uh, kind of a, a resolution-wise limited test, whereas when we go to microarray, I try to look within this chromosome, even the tinier of regions, uh, tiny regions, I would be looking and the uh, data looks something like this, where you get one dot representing one region of the chromosome. And then we can read this and uh, through a software and then we can say whether some region of the chromosome is missing or extra. So this is like a little bit zoomed in view of the uh, city of Hyderabad, where we can see some of the major landmarks. Uh, now, uh, which are not visible when we were looking at a karyotype or a zoomed out view. And then Sanger sequencing is where we are actually reading the DNA sequence. But for doing this test, we need to know which region to sequence. So it's a very targeted kind of a test. It uh, So it's like, you know, we are putting in Google Earth and just zooming in onto the Charminar. And then here we can study uh, Charminar in great detail, but then I am missing out the rest of the city. So this is an extremely targeted test. It will give you more details. It's a gold standard for sequencing the DNA, but here uh, it's limited in the fact that it's extremely targeted and mostly prenatally it won't be relevant because we don't have a single diagnosis in mind prenatally. And then this is the basically the technological advance, which has now come whereby we are able to sequence the whole of the genomic DNA in a single experiment and now so that it becomes a test which is genome wide also and it is also very high resolution whereby we are actually able to sequence each and every um, base in the DNA. So classically what we are using in the clinic is an exome sequencing which is sequencing of the coding part of the DNA. So our genomic DNA 97% of it is non-coding. 3% of it is coding, but most of the diseases, that's around 97, 98% are due to mutations in the coding region. So uh, we have the essay, which is the exome sequencing essay, we, where we sequence only the coding region so that you are able to pick up most of the single gene disorders. So this is akin to doing, putting a Google map view where uh, a Google Earth view, where you are seeing the whole city and you're also seeing the various uh, details. Uh, so it's it's basically possible due to this technological advancement. So now I'll just take uh, through some cases and we'll try to see in which case, which test was done and why was that test chosen and how did it change the scenario for that particular family. So here, I mean, I'm 
I am sure that most of you would be familiar with this symbol. This is a pedigree or a diagrammatic representation of a family tree where the squares represent male, circles represent females. And this uh, line, horizontal line is a marriage line, the vertical line is an offspring line. So a single line means a non-consignous couple. So we have a non-consignous couple, previous healthy child and now at 18 weeks pregnancy, they've come for a scan and scan is showing something like this. So this is basically a uh, lober holoprosent carefully where we can see the fused thalami and a single ventricular cavity over here. Normal, then we start thinking of other possible findings. So again, uh, even copy number abnormalities are pretty common. There are various kinds, so not a single uh, type. So here we would be, if you want to look for that, we do a chromosomal microarray. And even single gene disorders contribute significantly, 10 to 25% of holoprosent carefully. Majority are non-syndromic and inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So here it's very interesting. So suppose your karyotype came to be normal, then what do I choose? Do I do a... Uh, a microarray or do I, do I do a single gene testing? So it's a simple step here is to take a look at the parents and to again go back to the family pedigree because most of these single gene disorders are dominant. So you would find that one of the parent may be having some minor form of holoprosent carefully and the only feature could be uh, probably uh, in if the patient is, I mean, the family is sitting in front of you to look at the face you could find some subtle findings like hypotelorism or a single uh, central upper incisor. So these are some of the clues which could tell you, uh, alert you that probably in this family, it's a monogenic form. So then you would directly go ahead and do the sequencing test and I couldn't omit the microarray over here. So um, again, uh, taking the family history and trying to see if anybody in the family has intellectual disabilities, seizures, Sometimes the family may not come forth with this information, so we have to ask these leading questions. And with that, again, we can be uh, uh, we know that which test to do next. And why is this relevant? I mean, anyway, we are terminating, right? So it's relevant because, of course, for chromosomal abnormalities, we are not expecting a recurrence unless, of course, in some cases, you can have some balanced chromosomal rearrangement in one of the parent. And again, CNVs also, we don't expect them to recur, but these single gene disorders are the ones which are likely to recur. And unless we test and we find the mutation, we will miss these cases. So we really need to test, even though the family may have decided to terminate the pregnancy. So this I've covered. So examine the parents, uh, look for these micro forms of holoprosent carefully. And also in the patient or the fetus, look for additional findings. Sometimes you may find some other syndromic findings. So uh, like in the, like there is one condition, like what I mentioned previously in the slide, smith lemley opitz syndrome, where you could have additional findings like ambiguous genitalia, post-exile polydactyly. So these could again give you some diagnostic clues and guide you which test to do. And uh, doing the test, of course, helps us in the subsequent counseling and recurrence risk reduction. So now let's quickly move on to the second case. Again, we have a non-consignous couple, previous healthy baby. Now at 18 weeks, this particular pregnancy, we are seeing two findings in the scan. These are again, um, not any gross malformation per se, but these are just some subtle findings. We also call them as soft markers. So one is the pilectasis, which is there. Again, very mild. And then we have this mild ventriculomegaly, uh, atrial diameter being 11 millimeter. So basically what we have here is uh, kind of two soft markers which are there. But of course, ventriculomegaly, mild ventriculomegaly at this gestation, we uh, usually we call it as a soft marker. But this could be a sign of later evolving uh, uh, findings which could come later in gestation. So here in this particular case, again, an amniocentesis was done and the karyotype was normal. But now we need to realize that karyotype, as I mentioned before also, doesn't pick up everything, right? So we need to now think of what next test this particular patient would need. So here a chromosomal microarray was done. And in fact, this fetus was found to have a really huge duplication in the eighth chromosome, QR. So, uh, and this particular region actually contained, uh, it's a very gene rich region. It's uh, so whenever we find something like this, we always go back to the uh, further databases, uh, disease databases, population databases. We try to look at these regions, are they seen in normal individuals? So here, this particular duplication is never reported in normal people. And in fact, when we see uh, look at the disease uh, databases, we find that this is in fact, duplication of this region is known to be associated with abnormal phenotype. 
So once we have this information, then we know that yes, this baby is not like un, not not likely to be normal. These are not benign findings now. So accordingly, we can counsel this family. So again, here this was missed on karyotype. Uh, although it was a large duplication, it should have been picked up, but the resolution of that particular karyotype was, uh, I mean, the quality was not that great. Uh, so, but um, microarray would give you even smaller deletions and duplications, and many of them can be pathogenic. So, uh, when we have mild ventricular megaly, we need to remember that chromosomal disorders, that is the numerical ones, which will be picked up by doing a simple karyotype, are seen in 5% of cases, even if it's an isolated finding. And uh, copy number defects would be seen if isolated in 9%. And if there are, of course, other findings and in a large proportion. So we really need to test, even if it looks like an isolated mild ventriculomegaly, we need to do a microarray here and not restrict ourselves to karyotype. And uh, of course, I mean, uh, if we don't do the testing, we know that 75 to 92% would have a normal outcome but once we do the genetic testing this could change the situation either way so it's important to investigate so if we look at the performance of chromosomal microarray so it is able to pick up additional findings if you have a cns abnormality in this cases a microarray would find something pathogenic which would have important implications for postnatal outcome and this would be missed on a karyotype and if you have multiple findings then this figure could jump to 9 to 10%. So it's important to do microarray. In fact, now the recommendations have been there for more than a decade that if you have any abnormal ultrasound finding, then microarray is the first eye test of choice and not a simple karyotype. Whereas if you have a situation like a severe ventriculomegaly, so we know that yes, this is a poor outcome, of course, in the majority. And uh, but still, again, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to investigate. We need to do the genetic workup because this is not just about this pregnancy. This couple tomorrow would be maybe planning another pregnancy and then this testing would become relevant because depending on what you find, the recurrence risk for the next pregnancy could change. And if we have a genetic report in hand, we can provide them early prenatal testing by CVS as early as 11 to 13 weeks. And we don't need to have to wait for the scan or the fetal MRI or the neurosonogram to show us the findings, which would come much later in gestation. So again, we need to cover the chromosomal abnormalities, the copy number defects and single gene disorders also come into picture. So in severe ventricular megaly, one important thing in male fetuses is the L1-CAM associated X-linked aqueductal stenosis. So this could be seen in around one-fifth of male fetuses presenting with a severe ventricular megaly. And there are more than 100 other disorders, single gene disorders, which will present with ventricular megaly, ranging from mild to severe. So now we have data saying that overall there are around 20% cases of ventriculomegaly are because of these single gene disorder. Of course, this data is still emerging. So we don't have the exact figure. So you can look at the range here. It's really uh, wide. But uh, yes, there seems to be a significant contribution. And we should be investigating now for single gene disorders also. Because these also have a very important relevance because these are the situations which are likely to recur as compared to the chromosomal abnormality as a copy number defects, which are most of the times de novo. So they don't, they're less likely to recur in subsequent pregnancies. So this is a case which kind of shows how a genetic workup really impacts a, a situation where probably, you know, otherwise if you, we would not have thought that much or not worked that much, we could, this uh, family would have remained in a kind of an uncertain situation. And uh, so here, basically, we have a consanguineous couple here now that we see the two lines joining them and they had one abortion. And this is one child who they had actually brought to us at around six months of age. And she was having developmental delay and other morbidities. And uh, she also had a corpus callosum agenesis. So she was, uh, but uh, when they had got the child at that point of time, we had advised them for a genetic workup but they were lost to follow up and they never came back. So uh, this, in fact, is a, I mean, kind of, we can say a recurrent uh, problem in our country in a way where uh, patients, uh, uh, like, you know, the index child workup is not really there. And then the uh, patient comes to us directly in pregnancy and then we are 
kind of lost and we do not know, um, you know, it becomes tricky or difficult to proceed further. So it's very important, like, you know, as, uh, I mean, as pediatric neurologist, from your perspective, that when you have an index case, that that particular case really needs a genetic workup, especially important for that child, of course, but also very, very important for the couple who would be planning again and who would be wanting to avoid a similar recurrence in subsequent pregnancy. And the best time to work up is preconception because sometimes these genetic workups can take a lot of time and um, sometimes we have some variants of uncertain significance. We have to do certain further uh, investigations before we can make a conclusion. So the preconception period is the best time to refer such patients, the index cases to a geneticist who would be able to further evaluate. Unfortunately, like in this family, it was not done. And now this couple also directly came to us in pregnancy. So uh, then at 17 weeks here uh, itself, we were seeing that there is some, probably some uh, ventriculomegaly starting, some dangling in the choroid was starting. So at this point, we did an amniocentesis the kerotype was normal and we planned for an MRI. So an MRI was done at around 19 weeks and uh, it again confirmed that this fetus also had a corpus callosum agenesis. So again, now um, just to step back. Uh, so if you have an isolated corpus callosum agenesis, we know that a significant proportion, 60 to 75% will have a normal postnatal outcome. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we again need to remember that yes, this isolated finding, what you're seeing in scan, could be part of a genetic syndrome, which could again be a chromosomal abnormality, a copy number variant, or a single gene disorder. So all these three categories of genetic disorders are possible. And in all these three, you would have intellectual handicap. So in this particular family, because they already had a child with the uh, similar neuroimaging finding and with a poor outcome. So here we are anyway, we kind of anticipated that probably the outcome for this fetus is also likely to be poor. And so accordingly, we were able to counsel them and then they went ahead and they did the termination. On autopsy, actually, there was no dysmorphism in the fetus and the only gross finding was the corpus callosum agenesis. There was nothing else specific in the gross autopsy finding. But when the brain histology was done, there were multiple, I mean, there were significant findings and which can be correlated with the phenotype of the first child in terms of the developmental delay and the seizures. So there was abnormal cortical layering. There was also multiple foci of cortical, cortical uh, dysgenesis, which was seen. So with this now, uh, now uh, we know that, yes, this couple had two children, similar findings. And uh, now what genetic test should we be doing here? So here we need to, again, go back a little bit to the pedigree. And we see that, yes, this is a consanguous couple. And uh, the fetal karyotype has already come out to be normal. So now there is no role of doing a microarray in this case. Here, what we are looking at basically is a most likely an autosomal recessive disorder, whereby both parents are carrier and two children have had that condition. That's why you have that recurrence. So here we can directly go for testing for single gene disorders. There is with this much information, uh, which we have got from the family pedigree, the family structure, the consanguinity part, and the findings in the fetus. So that's what we did. So again, uh, now going for single gene testing, as I mentioned before, doing Sanger sequencing mostly is not possible because this is not like a, a single diagnosis. Uh, it uh, in Now we are looking at something very non-specific. These kind of findings can be part of so many genetic conditions. So what we do is a next generation sequencing based test so that we are able to cover this, all the various different conditions. So here we did the exome sequencing on this fetal DNA and we were able to find that the fetus had a frame shift deletion in this particular gene, EPG5 gene. And actually at that particular point of time, there were only some less than 10 cases reported with these mutations. And this is actually causes a condition called as Vicky syndrome. So this again now, uh, but this was in fact one of our initial cases and we were still doubtful because this particular syndrome has multiple other findings uh, which are difficult to see in a fetus. So we went back and we reviewed the records of the previous child. So we found that this child had various other comorbidities uh, before she had expired. And uh, in terms of recurrent infections, cardiomegaly and a, very, a fair complexion compared to parents. So when we kind of do this kind of a genotype-phenotype correlation, 
where we do a detailed phenotyping and we correlate it the, with the molecular uh, findings, then we are able to finally say that, yes, this is uh, consistent with what we are looking, finding in the report. And this fetus is also affected with this Avicii syndrome and the previous child was also probably similarly affected. So now we know that we are confirmed this is an autosomal recessive condition. This is the mutation in the family. The recurrence risk is 25%. And with this much information in hand, we can provide now prenatal testing by 11 to 13 weeks by CVS, even before the corpus callosum is formed or we are able to see it by any means. And luckily for this family, the next baby turned out to be a healthy baby. So in fact, so uh, this just to show that uh, we need to kind of, you know, through these cases that we need to remember the three categories of genetic disorders and the we need to test for each of them, but which test to do first needs to be guided by what we know about that condition and the particular patient in front of you and so many the other findings. So in fact, we this is what we have published with regard to the Mendelian disorders or single gene disorders in fetal phenotypes. So we have done some 100 plus uh, fetal exomes and we have found that around 44% of our cases at least, of course, there is a kind of an ascertainment and a referral bias because we are sitting in a tertiary center, uh, but 44% uh, uh, of our fetuses are turning out to actually have this single gene disorder and this yield is much higher than what we are finding by doing a chromosomal microarray. And interestingly, in India, most conditions are autosomal recessive, unlike the Western world where there are more do uh, dom autosomal dominant or x -link. And if we look at the CNS cases in our series, so again, these were a large proportion. So uh, again, vouching for the fact that CNS anomalies are one of the commonest anomalies seen. And again, here also for the CNS anomalies, around 45 to 50 percent diagnostic yield is there by doing an exome sequencing. So this is, in fact, a recent meta-analysis which has been published to try and look how common are single gene disorders in the various CNS anomalies. And, um, and then on the basis of that, like, you know, uh, of course, we don't have right now guidelines, but it's, uh, it's I mean, uh, we expect that single gene testing should form a major uh, kind of, you know, uh, one of the important tests which we should be thinking about. So, in fact, this meta-analysis has said, uh, has shown that the overall diagnostic yield is around 32% for all CNS anomalies, of course, a little bit higher when you have a multi-system finding. And across the various type of CNS findings, the yield is almost similar. So, it's somewhere around 30, 30%. So, there is a very significant contribution of single gene disorders in the various types of CNS findings. And we should really be testing for this when we are faced especially in a uh, fetal scenario. So just uh, another important aspect when we are doing the testing is again what I mentioned previously also is the phenotyping becomes very important because very often these kind of genetic reports will give you something called as a variant of uncertain significance and then you don't know where to go from there. And in a prenatal setting, it's really uh, now a uh, it's a great difficulty of how to counsel that particular family. So um, these uh, a phenotyping becomes a cortical layering. But what was very interesting were the eye findings. So the fetus uh, had a cataract and the fetus also had a retinal detachment. So when we put all these things together, actually what we come to a diagnosis, a working diagnosis is of a dystoglyconopathy. Or uh, here again, this is a spectrum of condition but basically the most severe phenotype which presents prenatally is walker warburg syndrome so these are all autosomal recessive conditions but they can be caused by mutations in 12 different genes so again for doing the molecular testing we need ngs so that's what was done here and this fetus was found to have a mutation in this particular gene so finally we were able to confirm molecularly confirm what we found on the autopsy so um, had we not had the done the autopsy, had we not done the detailed histology, we would not reach this point where we knew that what test we need to do next. So we would, uh, you know, maybe do a uh, microarray or a kerotype as per the, you know, the recommend the existing recommendation. But when you do this kind of a detailed phenotyping, you know what test, what you're dealing with, and you know what is the next genetic test which is required. So here, it, uh, it, of course, it changed the recurrence risk for the family, which is 5% for a sporadic entity to 25% for an autosomal recessive disorder. 
and again we can give them a definitive pnd so how do we approach uh, in clinical settings uh, uh, what genetic workup to do so there are mainly three things uh, first thing of course the finding in the fetus so what is the kind of finding you are seeing so if it's holoprosen carefully i know that first i should do a karyotype if it is something like uh, a, a maybe a molar tooth sign, then I know I'm looking at Jupert. So I will directly go for exome. So look, the kind of finding and what is the genetic basis of that finding? That's one important handle. And then, of course, is there an isolated finding or a multiple finding? If you have a multisystemic involvement, again, you know you're looking at a genetic syndrome. So then we look at does the pattern fit into a specific condition? So suppose you have holoprosen carefully, post exil polytactly and multisystic kidney, then I am thinking of trisomy 13. If I'm looking at uh, enkephalocele post exil polytactly and uh, again multisystic dysplastic kidney, I'm looking at Meckel Gruber. So I will do an exome. So uh, we need to uh, know, uh, kind of have this much information or make this kind of a working diagnosis before deciding which genetic test to do to save time and to save money also for the patient. So um, the uh, working clinical differential is very important. And of course, we also need to look at the mother. Are there any other factors which could cause that uh, particular finding? So um, the age becomes important. If you're looking at maybe a mild ventriculomegaly in a 40-year-old, I would think of Down syndrome as my first differential. So again, various maternal diseases, teratogenic exposures and all could result in a specific finding which you are looking at. And then the most important uh, thing for us geneticists and for everybody, it should be now, it should be a practice to look at the family structure, to take a detailed three generation family history to see if there is any consanguinity. Uh, consanguinity increases the risk for uh, autosomal recessive conditions primarily, then look at whether any previous sibling is affected, other family member is affected, which again gives you clue towards the inheritance pattern. So again, that gives you an idea about what text test to do next. So these three factors kind of help, that in, uh, help us in uh, deciding what could be our first diet test. But broadly, we need to remember that we need to cover the three categories of genetic conditions, the cross chromosomal abnormalities, the copy number defects, and uh, the single gene disorders. So again, which to do first would depend on what is your working clinical differential as based on what I the previous three things which we are looking at, the fetus, the patient, and the family. So you could be doing an exome sequencing as your first diet test in a particular scenario. It need not always go from karyotype, microarray, exome sequencing. So it could vary depending on what you, the particular situation which you are faced with. And then of course, I mean, we've discussed this uh, now already that uh, in um, CNS anomaly specifically, we have this scenario where we have certain findings which have were uncertain, which raise a lot of uncertainty, which uh, outcome could be normal to um, uh, severe ID. So things like isolated um, corpus callosomaginesis, isolated mild ventriculomegaly, or even vernius hypoplasia, or other posterior first abnormalities, which may not always be easily distinguishable. So uh, these are your uncertain bag where you really don't know how to counsel. And in fact, I would say that that's where a genetic test becomes important because doing a genetic workup, ruling out a genetic etiology would probably help you in reassuring the family towards a positive outcome. And whereas finding something in a genetic report would lead you to the other direction. And then we also have in CNS the evolving anomalies or evolving problems, whereby something things classically would be a micro carefully. So maybe by late second trimester, you're just seeing minus two SD head circumference. But later on by third trimester, you know, you would actually see the actual micro carefully coming in and there may not be any other finding. So many of these fetuses actually could be having a primary autosomal recessive micro carefully, which are all monogenic conditions. And then also the migration abnormalities, the milder ones may come later in gestation. So these are all tricky things which are specific to uh, the CNS. And sometimes, of course, we are not able to intervene also and not able to still give a clear picture to the family. And of course, uh, we have the poor prognosis findings, which although would eventually lead to a termination, but these also still need to be really investigated for the future counseling of the family. So to, to conclude, basically now, uh, 
in CNS anomalies, there is a significant contribution of genetic etiologies. And this could range from a chromosomal abnormality to a copy number abnormality to a single gene disorder. So we need to kind of do testing for this because if it's a finding which is probably an, of uncertain outcome, so this could help you in more accurate prognostication of that case. And even if you have a poor outcome anomaly, this would help us in a recurrence risk estimation for subsequent pregnancy. And uh, the genetic worker basically needs to be one thing comprehensive and uh, guided. It should be an informed guided testing. So uh, like uh, again and again, like I've emphasized, so uh, you, know, you should be able to kind of synthesize some kind of a working uh, clinical uh, diagnosis. And based on that, you uh, kind of take the next step forward and decide to what extent and what tests you need to do. Preferably involve a geneticist because uh, we would be able to kind of, you know, help you in kind of um, taking these kind of uh, decisions as to which test to do first and what, you know, doing that genotype phenotype correlation part, which is difficult otherwise. And um, again, not to kind of, you know, the last not but not the least definitely is that autopsy is extremely important for the detailed phenotypic delineation if a family terminates a pregnancy because uh, especially for uh, cns findings uh, the histopathology of the brain can give you important information and this can help you further to decide the genetic test or to correlate your genetic test findings uh, with your uh, autopsy findings so uh, with this i would end Thank you very much, ma'am, for this enlightening talk. And we really enjoyed listening to the cases. So uh, I have a question and a similar question is also asked by a participant that uh, with the uh, next generation next generation based tests like whole exome and a combination available with CNV pickup. So, uh, uh, so let us say we have a condition, let us say a ventriculomegaly, which is which may be caused by deletion duplications or single gene mutations. So, would you prefer whole exome sequencing with CNV with copy number variations as your first test? And if that turns out to be normal, would you stop at that or also go ahead with the CNV? So, see, in a prenatal setting, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of cons, uh, cons I mean, constraints and a lot of things others to concern. One is time is very important. So, uh, because all these tests have a turnaround time. So, doing one test after the other, sometimes time-wise, it may not really be uh, feasible. So, in um, such a situation, I mean, ideally, although, yes, exome sequence, Sequencing is able to pick up the CNVs, but it's not the ideal test for a CNV. It can have both false positives and false negative. So when there is a prenatal scenario, if there is a time constraint and uh, I mean, money is not a constraint, then uh, I would do both simultaneously. So, but of course, sometimes, I mean, it doesn't happen because for various reasons and financial constraints are one of the major reasons. So then I would probably, you know, take a, a kind of a decision based on other things what I mentioned. You know, suppose there is some other clue in the family. You know, maybe a previous child also had ventriculomegaly. Then I would probably, you know, do an exome first. So, it, I mean, I could decide depending on other factors also. So, but yes, ideally both uh, we would like to do. Okay. There is another question related to the uh, case of the Vicky syndrome. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Anil Astrani has asked that did skeletal muscle or cardiac muscle histopath on autopsy also showed any storage material? Um, no, not that I know of, but I could look into that. But I don't think there was any abnormality. But I, I believe our histopathologist probably did not even look specifically for those. So, I can get back to you on that. Thank you, ma'am. Another question uh, by a participant, and maybe Dr. Shubha, ma'am, can also guide us regarding that. That what is your experience regarding children with uh, CCA genesis and long term outcomes? I think rather than experience, we should review the literature. The lit there is a lot of literature and the recent um, uh, 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 studies and uh, uh, review of uh, uh, meta-analysis, those are uh, very important. I think you are asking about aplasia of corpus callosum. You use some short forms. So. Uh, 
the participant right cca genesis so yes applies ah, purpose ka, okay so now the, i think of the, we have seen many of these um, uh, findings evolve over time the data get, get uh, getting better and better so now there is lot of data of prenatally detected uh, agenesis of corpus callosum as well as those children who are diagnosed after birth and then uh, their uh, neurological outcome and all that so i think rather than our own experience of one or two or 10 cases this data is very very uh, like reasonably big data is available and we should use them and the only thing is when we talk about this data it is isolated and prenatally isolated calling it isolated is sometimes difficult but every attempt should be made to look at the associated findings. And if one has a knowledge of syndromes, like if there is corpus callosum agenesis, then looking at uh, uh, digits, because acrocalosal syndrome, there is polydectaly. And so these type of findings become very important uh, diagnostic clues. In case of even ventriculomegaly, when we say isolated ventriculomegaly, the outcome is reasonably good even for the moderate as well as sometimes severe because the size of cerebral mantle does not make much the definite uh, give information about outcome. So associated abnormalities like adducted thumb. So if there is adducted thumb in ultrasonography, then we know this is L1 cam related and the outcome is not going to be good. So looking for associated malformations specific for those syndromes and therefore that in knowledge of syndromes is very important. So um, I would like to add that uh, uh, Shagun had chosen very three important uh, malformations, holoprosin cephaly, aplasia of corpus callosum and ventriculomegaly. So the heterogeneous etiologies uh, are very, very uh, specific for these disorders. And to look for etiology, not only by uh, testing, but also ultrasonography can give, uh, again, as I said, uh, uh, microphthalmia and cataract. These are the two things which can be looked for in these fetuses with aplasia of corpus callosum and ventriculomegaly because then it gives a clue that it could be uh, syndromic congenital muscular dystrophy and the outcome would be then definitely uh, poor as compared to isolated ventriculomegaly. So I think uh, looking for associated malformation, I would like to stress because that is less time consuming as compared to microarray and, uh, and that will also give you idea whether to go for exome sequencing first or microarray first because if it is specifically if you find uh, something which are very specific like l1 cam uh, mutation then you know monogenic then you don't do microarray you do exome sequencing first so that way one can be um, and uh, one thing i would like to add also is when we look at copy number variations so there are very small number of cases but there is double segment imbalance so there is a deletion at the end of one chromosome, like chromosome 7, and then duplication at the end of chromosome 8. So identifying these cases are very, very important because there will be very high risk of recurrence in these families as some of the parents may be having chromosomal abnormalities balanced. And sometimes these imbalances are so matching that if you do karyotypes of the parents, you will not identify because the sizes are so similar of the uh, one from uh, a, a duplication of one chromosome and deletion. So a karyotype may not pick up. So uh, microarray uh, and the clue, clue would be that if there are multiple abortions in this family and this fetus has abnormality or the previous child has intellectual disability and then the child, this fetus has abnormality. That suggests that the recurrences with dissimilar phenotype can be because of uh, uh, such type of double segment imbalances. And these could be inherited from one of the parents who is a carrier of balanced chromosomal abnormality. And hence microarray or sometimes even just sub MLPA. There is a test called MLPA, which looks at only ends of chromosomes. And that can identify these type of imbalances, which are uh, likely to recur. And the cost is less for that. So if there are cost constraints for doing microarray, then MLPA for subtylomeric regions 
in every fetus or any spontaneous abortion would be a very important way to identify those families who are at high risk of recurrence. And these are the cases where pre-implantation diagnosis also would be very, very helpful. Thank you, ma'am. Actually, I'm competing in because actually we are half an hour behind schedule. So uh, I'll request uh, Juhi, can you just ask the questions to Dr. Mandeep as well? And then we'll go through all the speakers and the experts for their final take-home messages. Uh, so first, you please ask Dr. Mandeep the questions which are there in the box. So uh, I'll combine the two questions by the participants. They both address that how does the fetal surgery improve the bladder bubble dysfunction in these children with spina bifida and i'll add a part of the question uh, a question of mine to this that what is the status of fetal surgery in india we have experts from turkey in turkey and what is the ethical approval for these surgeries and are these surgeries done only for certain situations or they are done for many situations many conditions now even in the developing world I think I'll answer the second part. Obviously, fetal surgery and fetal therapy is advancing rapidly. Uh, uh, I think it's very important to do uh, good counseling and the parents' wishes to be respected. If they want to go ahead with the in utero spinal bifida repair, then we do that. Uh, with regards to the why is the outcome better, as I said in the MOM study, they proved that the outcome is better if uh, uh, surgery is done in utero and that is because the spinal cord is exposed to the amniotic fluid in a non-repaired case. That means that the spinal cord can be damaged because of the amniotic fluid, the meconium, the constant pressure, abrasion, infection and hemorrhage. And that is the reason why the spinal cord gets damaged. The longer the exposure, the more the damage. By closing it at 24 weeks, we reduce the amount, the time that the spinal cord is exposed to the amniotic fluid. Right, right. And uh, maybe Dr. Prashant Acharya can guide us about the fetal surgeries in India. Are they done? And for what all situations? At the moment, at the moment, no. They are not done in India. Because there are a few good reasons why people are not opting for it. First is in India, when, when we spend even 100 rupees, we have got something called in in our mind there is what is a guarantee how 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 much how much the, the this is going to last this is going to give me complete complete whatever whatever i want in that amount of money this is exactly what patient expects the moment you operate you you think about operating a fetus or operating a mother they will always think about iska sab iska kaisa rahega outcome sab sahi ho jayega na they think that everything is going to be all right because in india patient has to pay from their pocket in many of the Western world, it's a government who spends the money and patient doesn't have to pay anything. So they will expect, okay, whatever I am getting, it's always a benefit. So let me take that benefit. Here, the things are very different. Patient has to pay, how, whether they are affording or they are not affording. You, you are talking about folic acid deficiency zone. You, you are talking about a, 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 a relatively, you are a poor economical strata, which you are talking about. And when uh, the overall expend, expenditure is going to be almost around Four to five lakh of rupees in, in, in India with almost around uh, 60. I don't think, Mandi, please correct me if I'm wrong, that the outcome may be good in case of, of almost around 50 to 60 percent of the cases. And there are selection criteria how, how to choose that patient. Not all spinal defect uh, can be operated. It, there should not be any cranial sign or with no, not very prominent cranial sign. The cerebellum has to be reasonably in good shape. So there are there are a few selection criteria. If that follows, that they are followed in that group, can afford, can accept those what are whatever the remaining deficiencies after the surgery also. So there are very few limited group of people who, who are who are really the real candidate. So that's the reason in India it is it is yet not started probably and and the acceptance is probably still it is low. I I wish it will go up in the future so that we can always take up. We do. Uh, Apart from open spinal defect or repair, we do all sorts of uh, fetal interventions. But because it is not, according to them, it may not be cost-effective procedure. So the acceptance is relatively le less in India. Maybe Dr. Pina can tell us about the situation in Turkey. Yes, I um, I don't think uh, it's the uh, operation in the fetal uh, period it's it's not available in 
in Turkey. I don't I don't know any uh, center that uh, operate this uh, babies. Um, most of the babies, actually all of them, uh, will uh, operate uh, post uh, um, postpartum in in the first week. Uh, I think. Mm -hmm. Right, ma'am. Ma'am, over to you and Dr. Prashant, sir, for the uh, final. I think one question is uh, last uh, one is left uh, about the bowel and bladder dysfunction. Dr. Mandeep, how fetal surgery can improve the bowel and bladder uh, dysfunction in fetal surgery as we found in post nasal surgery does not improve when these comorbidities exist to that extent? Yeah, it's just related to the exposure of the spinal cord to the amniotic fluid. The longer it is exposed, the more the damage. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mandeep. And uh, thank you, Dr. Shagun, for an excellent uh, uh, deliberations. Uh, Dr. Mandeep, I would like uh, request you to give some take-home messages. Uh, yeah, I think uh, um, good imaging, um, understanding the... Uh, CNS abnormality, uh, getting the pediatric neurologist and other members of the multidisciplinary team in providing good detail uh, to the parents and leaving the decision for the parents to make is what I would uh, say would be the best uh, way forward. Thank Can you I so add much. Just one... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Shubh. Yeah, because uh, pediatric neurologists are involved, so I just want to highlight one thing that the outcome of uh, fetal ventriculomegaly prenatally detected versus those present uh, to you as, as children uh, during neonatal period or infancy is very different because a lot of prenatally detected ventriculomegaly may be syndromic, may be born as a, may be still born, and then the outcome varies. So that probably the data of uh, outcomes of prenatally detected ventriculomegaly need to be used when we counsel the families or provide information regarding uh, outcome of these cases. So this is a very important thing. Anything Otherwise, else? Any other message? Ma'am, your message. All ventriculomegalies have very good outcome, yes. but that is the cases which you saw after birth. You see after birth. Um, any more message, ma'am? Overall, the whole session. I message will, for the pediatric. I will. I will tell you one thing. The pre what we have. I'm. I'm basically a Gujarati. So Gujaratis are really fond of making. Uh, they are good in business. And the same way which we have, we have just, our, our calculations are really good. So we have formulated what we call as a thumb rule, just to remember how to counsel. So when a condition which is isolated, we have formulated for four things for the brain malformation. One, severe hydrocephalus, or when the ventricles is going to be more than 15 to 20 millimeter. When the ventricle, is, they are between uh, 10 to 12, we call it as a borderline ventricular megaly. Absent corpus callosum and posterior fossa malformation. So one out of two will have neurodevelopmental delay in case of hydrocephalus. One out of three will have neurodevelopmental delay when the case is having absent corpus callosum. One out of four means 25% will have neurodevelopmental delay if at all you have got a posterior fossa malformation or vermian hypo vermian agenesis or vermian hypoplasia. I'm not talking about Blake pulses. And one out of 10, that is almost around 7 to 10% with the borderline ventricular megaly. If you have investigated thoroughly with micro array, high resolution, then whole exome sequencing and a torch PCR for all brain malformations. These are the standard investigation because whether I do C first, I lose five weeks, then again two weeks, then again three weeks for karyotype. Because we are running late, we are not, not we are running against the time. 24 week that's a target in our mind so we usually order all three together I, where some or another investigation will help me in coming to a conclusion or coming to a diagnosis so one out of three two one out of three one out of four one out of ten may have neurodevelopmental delay if they are isolated micro array whole exome and torch pcr that's what we utilize my, all my residents all my fellows they are using the same kind of uh, in, in 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 a broader aspect what we call is a thumb rule of CNS malformation. That's what we, we counsel them. 
Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Pinar. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. I I don't have any uh, additional comments I mentioned before. Um, uh, what I uh, want to say and thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Shag. Thank you, Dr. Shagun. Yeah, I think we've covered almost everything. So for me, it's just you know like what I tried to uh, emphasize through my talk that we should try to you know kind of uh, as Shubha Madam also mentioned that uh, try to look for uh, other things. One thing, additional findings. I have tried to read up and have some basic uh, idea about the possible genetic etiologies or possible syndromes. Look for specific findings in the scan. Look for additional, make a three-generation pedigree, uh, ask details, sometimes leading questions to the family uh, regarding other similarly affected family members. Then based on all these things, take an informed decision uh, with respect to the genetic evaluation. And if you have a geneticist, clinical geneticist available, please involve them in your team because uh, especially in a prenatal scenario when the phenotype is not always complete. It, it's not complete because it's evolving and it's also not complete because everything can't be seen in scan. So because of, and the postnatal outcome, we, we are in a gray zone basically. So as uh, Dr. Shubha mentioned, so unlike what we are seeing postnatally, that's the ascertainment uh, of the same finding prenatally may have a very different outcome. So keeping all this in mind, uh, like we really need to invest uh, you know, kind of approach uh, uh, genetic testing and uh, involve all this information, your scan findings, uh, literature review, I believe, and uh, then proceed for a genetic workup. And the test may actually, you know, help you that pregnancy prognostication and also help the family for uh, next pregnancy in terms of a recurrence risk prediction. So... Uh, it has to be a teamwork is, you know, at the end of the day and uh, often, uh, you know, you would be needing to read uh, because there is a question also with risk, respect, oh, are there any standard guidelines or anything? So most of the time uh, for individual condition, we would have to refer to, uh, we would have to review literature. You would have to read more in detail about that specific finding when you are faced for, you know, in a prenatal situation specifically. Thank you, Dr. Regarding Shubha. You exome sequencing, yeah. just I want to add, regarding exome sequencing, as everybody knows, neurologists that preferable is to do trio, child and the parents. And prenatally, this is very, very important because prenatally, if you do only of the fetus and then you get something which is very uh, doubtful and then to decide whether it's de novo or whether it's inherited from parents, it's very important because if then you will need to do exome again and five more weeks. So basically, if you want to um, ask the family and family wants to get exome sequencing in a prenatally, always do it as a trios. Doing isolated will cause more uh, uncertainties and pose more dilemmas for the counselor as well as more decision-making problems for the family. So the testing should resolve the issues rather than create new more uncertainties. So trio exome sequencing is very important, especially in prenatal cases. Thank you so much, ma'am. We've crossed 44 minutes beyond our time. Uh, Prashant Johri, you want to add something? Prashant Johri? Yeah. No, I, don't. I think we have all covered it quite well. I'll just say ki, this is definitely a multidisciplinary uh, issue where we have to have the fetal myths and the fetal radiologist, clinical geneticists all together so that we as pediatric neurologists, we can formulate some sort of a counseling session. So uh, I think he, uh, this is the message from my end. And I'm very happy and thankful to all the speakers. Thank you. Juhi, want to say something? Juhi? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else from the panelists want to add or say something? Otherwise, I want to uh, thank everybody, all the speakers and all the experts and all the attendees. And I think uh, if it's acceptable to all the panelists right now and the speakers and experts that, you know, we may bring out some kind of guidelines, uh, which may be first 
of its kind from our side. And I think uh, uh, you know, that's why I was reaching out uh, with Will Richard with the contact details of uh, all of us and we can have a WhatsApp group and then we can make it. And I think that would be important because fetal neurology is something which is upcoming and would be very important. And ultimately, as Dr. Shubha did mention that PIGD, they think ultimately it's going to be pre-implantation genetic testing and pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which will be the future, although that's currently only for thalassemia in India, right, ma'am? It's currently with thalassemia only right now, no? So we in India. So yeah, we but I'm not I'm not saying that it should be done for only for especially for the disorders because nee, of nee, future. So, so nee, nee, I'm, not, I'm not advocating pre-implantation. I'm not much for autosomal resistance. Uh, so nee, 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 for I'm the just structural saying, translocations not, where possibility uh, of recurrence is very high. And so yeah. then probably uh, there uh, probably it's a real indication if somebody yes. has three years. Uh, so that is no no what no no ma'am that is the there for experts that implantation diagnosis is not because no no my so many issues. No, no. <laughs> No, no, no. What I want to say, you're not getting the point is that that in the future, in certain situations, which will have definite clinical indications that PIGD and all will be a definite reality right now coming only for thalassemia in India. No, madam, I'm I, not I, telling I in which differ. situations, not in which. Mm -hmm. No, no. I, I, it may not be referral to the malformations ones. There are, it's the many other conditions it's being studied. I'm just saying in the future, it is going to be a possibility. And obviously, we'll have to have proper indications, uh, which have obviously to be be debated and concluded. What I meant was that kind of technology has now come up. Now we saw Dr. Mandi time that although it was palliative, but they were doing the in utero thing. So I'm just saying even before that, with specific very specific. It can't be run of the mill thing indications, which I'm not debating at all. I'm just mentioning a technique, ma'am. I'm not even saying what indication that the technique is coming up, the technology is coming up, and it will be a reality in whichever condition it gets indicated. That's what I mean. Cannot be run of the mill. Yeah. I, I mean, I absolutely take care. I was just trying to say a technology is available, come getting available, which may be accessible to us even in India, in whichever way, which will be decided. I am not at all mentioning which condition just a mentioning of the technology map yeah okay thank you very much thank you thank you so much and next week we come back with the next sig next sig for uh, april is an autism so next four weeks we're going to come with the uh, autism uh, special interest group sessions and also one additional session would be on parent awareness which will be uh, besides uh, wednesday which will be shared with you and thank you so much uh, everybody for joining it was very wonderful and all passionate people working in this area thank you so much and i think we will just start out with some kind of an you know uh, uh, guidance paper or something from and i think i'll request prashant jory to coordinate with all the experts thank you so much thank, thank you. you thank you thank you ma'am Thank you. Thank you. Good, Good night. night. Bye. See Good. you next week. See you next week. Same time. Thank you. Okay.